Section 2 of Astounding Stories, March 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Winterout. Astounding Stories, March 1930. Section 2, Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings. Chapters 1 through 3. Forward by Ray Cummings. I have been thinking that if, during one of those long winter evenings at Valley Forge, someone had placed in George Washington's hands one of our present-day bestsellers, the illustrious father of our country would have read it with considerable emotion. I do not mean what we call a story of science or fantasy, just a novel of action, adventure, and romance, the sort of thing you and I like to read but do not find amazing in any way at all. But I fancy that George Washington would have found it amazing, don't you? It might picture, for instance, a factory girl at a sewing machine. George Washington would be amazed at a sewing machine. And the girl, journeying in the subway to and from her work, stealing an opportunity to telephone her lover at the noon hour, going to the movies in the evening, or listening to a radio. And there might be a climax, perhaps, with the girl and the villain in a transcontinental railway pullman, and the hero sending frantic telegrams or telephoning the train and then chasing it in his airplane. George Washington would have found it amazing. And I am wondering how you and I would feel if someone were to give us now a book of ordinary adventure of the sort which will be published 150 years hence. I have been trying to imagine such a book and the nature of its contents. Let us imagine it together. Suppose we walk down Fifth Avenue a pleasant spring morning of May 2080. Fifth Avenue, no doubt, will be there. I don't know whether the New York Public Library will be there or not. We'll assume that it is, and it has some sort of books printed or in whatever fashion you care to imagine. The young man library attendant is surprised at our curiously antiquated aspect. We look as though we were dressed for some historical costume ball. We talk old-fashioned English, like actors in a historical play of the 1930 period. But we get the book. The attendant assures us it is a good average story of action and adventure, nothing remarkable, but he read it himself and found it interesting. We thank him and take the book, but we find that the language in which it is written is too strange for comfortable reading, and it names so many extraordinary things so casually, as though we knew all about them, which we certainly do not. So we take it to the kind-hearted librarian in the language division. He modifies it to old-fashioned English of 1930, and he puts occasional footnotes to help explain some of the things we might not understand. Why he should bother to do this for us, I don't know, but let us assume that he does. And now we take the book home in the pneumatic tube or aerial moving sidewalk or airship or whatever it is we take to get home. And now that we are home, let's read the book. It ought to be interesting. Chapter 1 tells of the Grant Line Moon Expedition and of the mysterious Martian who followed us in the city corridor. One may write about oneself and still not be an egoist, or so at least they tell me. My narrative went broadcast with a fair success. It was pantomimed, and the public flashed me a reasonable approval, and so my disc publishers have suggested that I record it in more permanent form. I introduce myself, begging grace that I intrude upon your busy minutes, with my only excuse that perhaps I may amuse you. For what the commercial sellers of my pictured version were pleased to blare as my handsome face, I ask your indulgence. My feminine audience of the pantomimes was undoubtedly graciously pleased at my personality and physical aspect, that I am tall as a Viking of old, and handsome as a young Norse god, is very pretty talk in the selling of my product, but I deplore its intrusion into the personality of this, my recorded narrative. And so now, for preface, to all my audience I do give earnest assurance that Greg Haljan is no conceited zebra, handsomely striped by nature and proud of it. Not so. I am, I do beg you to believe, a very humble fellow, striving for your approval, hoping only to entertain you. My Introduction my name, Greg Haljan. My age, 25 years. I was, at the time my narrative begins, 
third officer on the spaceship Planetara. Our line was newly established. In 2070, to be exact, following the modern improvements of the Martell magnetic levitation. Our ship, whose home port was Great New York, carried mail and passenger traffic to and from both Venus and Mars. Of astronomical necessity, our flights were irregular. This spring, with the two other planets both close to the Earth, we were making two complete round trips. We had just arrived in Great New York this May evening from Grebhar, Venus Free State. With only five hours in port here, we were departing the same night at the zero hour for Farak Shan, capital of the Martian Union. We were no sooner at the landing stage than I found a code flash summoning Dan Dean and me to Divisional Detective Headquarters. Dan Snap Dean was one of my closest friends. He was radio helio operator of the Planetara, a small, wiry, red-headed chap with a quick, ready laugh and a wit that made everyone like him. The summons to Detective Colonel Halsey's office surprised us. Snap eyed me. You haven't been opening any treasury vaults, have you, Greg? He wants you also, I retorted. He laughed. Well, he can roar at me like a traffic switchman, and my private life will remain my own. We could not think why we should be wanted. It was the darkness of mid-evening when we left the Planetara for Halsey's office. It was not a long trip. We went direct in the upper monorail, descending in the subterranean city at Park Circle 30. We had never been to Halsey's office before. We found it to be a gloomy, vault-like place in one of the deepest corridors. The door lifted. Greg Haljan and Daniel Dean. The guard stood aside. Come in. I own that my heart was unduly thumping as we entered. The door dropped behind us. It was a small, blue-lit apartment a steel-lined room like a vault. Colonel Halsey sat at his desk, and the big, heavy-set, florid Captain Carter, our commander of the Planetara, was here. That surprised us. We had not seen him leave the ship. Halsey smiled at us gravely. Captain Carter said, Sit down, lads. We took the seats. There was an alarming solemnity about this. If I had been guilty of anything that I could think of, it would have been frightening but Halsey's first words reassured me. It's about the Grantline Moon Expedition. In spite of our secrecy, the news has gotten out. We want to know how. Can you tell us? Captain Carter's huge bulk, he was about as tall as I am, towered over us as we sat before Halsey's desk. If you lads have told anyone, said anything, let's slip the slightest hint about it. Snap smiled with relief, but he turned solemn at once. I haven't, not a word. Nor have I, I declared. The Grantline Moon Expedition. We had not thought of that as a reason for this summons. Johnny Grantline was a close friend to us both. He had organized an exploring expedition to the moon. Uninhabited, with its bleak, forbidding, airless, waterless surface, the moon, even though so close to the Earth, was seldom visited. No regular ship ever stopped there. A few exploring parties of recent years had come to grief but there was a persistent rumor that upon the moon, mineral riches of fabulous wealth were awaiting discovery. The thing had already caused some interplanetary complications. The aggressive Martians would be only too glad to explore the moon, but the USW definitely warned them away. The moon was world territory, we announced, and we would protect it as such. The threatened conflict between the Earth and Mars had come to nothing. There was, this year of 2079, a thorough amity between all three of the inhabited planets. It still holds, and I pray that it may always hold. There was nevertheless a realization by our government that whatever riches might be upon the moon should be seized at once and held by some reputable earth company. And when Johnny Grantline applied, with his father's wealth and his own scientific record of attainment, the government was only too glad to grant him its writ. The Grantline expedition had started six months ago. The Martian government had acquiesced in our ultimatum, yet brigands have been known to be financed under cover of governmental disavowal, and so the expedition was kept secret. My words need give no offense to any Martian who comes upon them. I refer to the history of our Earth only. The Grantline expedition was on the moon now. No word had come from it. One could not flash helios even in code 
without letting all the universe know that explorers were on the moon, and why they were there, anyone could easily guess. And now Colonel Halsey was telling us that the news was abroad. Captain Carter eyed us closely. His flashing eyes under the white bushy brows would pry a secret from anyone. You're sure? A girl of Venus, perhaps, with her cursed seductive lure? A chance word with you lads befuddled by alkalite? We assured him we had been careful. By the heavens, I know that I had been. Not a whisper, even to snap, of the name Grantline in six months or more. Captain Carter added abruptly, We're insulated here, Halsey. Yes, talk as freely as you like. An eavesdropping ray will never get into these walls. They questioned us. They were satisfied at last that, though the secret had escaped, we had not done it. Hearing it discussed, it occurred to me to wonder why Carter was concerned. I was not aware that he knew of Grantline's venture. I learned now the reason why the Planetara, upon each of her voyages, had managed to pass fairly close to the moon. It had been arranged with Grantline that if he wanted help or had any important message, he was to flash it locally to our passing ship. And this Snap knew, and had never mentioned it even to me. Halsey was saying, Well, we can't blame you, but the secret is out. Snap and I regarded each other. What could anyone do? What would anyone dare do? Captain Carter said abruptly, Look here, lads. This is my chance now to talk plainly to you. Outside, anywhere outside these walls, an eavesdropping ray may be upon us. You know that. One may never even dare whisper since that accursed ray was developed. Snap opened his mouth to speak, but decided against it. My heart was pounding. Captain Carter went on. I know I can trust you two more than anyone else under me on the Planetara. What do you mean by that, I demanded. What? He interrupted me. Nothing at all but what I say. Halsey smiled grimly. What he means, Haljan, is that things are not always what they seem these days. One cannot always tell a friend from an enemy. The Planetara is a public vessel. You have, how many is it, Carter? Thirty or forty passengers this trip tonight? Thirty-eight, said Carter. There are thirty-eight people listed for the flight to Farrakh Shan tonight, Halsey said slowly. And some may not be what they seem. He raised his thin, dark hand. We have information, he paused. I confess we know almost nothing, hardly more than enough to alarm us. Captain Carter interjected. I want you and Dean to be on your guard. Once on the Planetara, it is difficult for us to talk openly, but be watchful. I will arrange for us to be doubly armed. Vague, perturbing words. Halsey said, They tell me George Prince is listed for the voyage. I am suggesting, Haljan, that you keep your eye especially upon him. Your duties on the Planetaria leave you comparatively free, don't they? Yes, I agreed. With the first and second officers on duty, and the captain aboard, my routine was more or less that of an understudy. I said, George Prince, who is he? A mechanical engineer, said Halsey, an underofficial of the Earth Federated Radium Corporation. But he associates with bad companions, particularly Martians. I had never heard of this George Prince, though I was familiar with the Federated Radium Corporation, of course, a semi-government trust which controlled virtually the entire Earth's supply of radium. He was in the automotive department, Carter put in. You've heard of the Federated Radium Motor? We had, of course, a recent Earth invention which promised to revolutionize the automotive industry, an engine of a new type using radium as its fuel. Snap demanded, what in the stars has this got to do with Johnny Grantline? Much, said Halsey quietly, or perhaps nothing. But George Prince some years ago mixed in rather unethical transactions. We had him in custody once. He is known now as unusually friendly with several Martians in New York of bad reputation. Well, began Snap, what you don't know, Halsey went on quietly, is that Grantline expects to find radium on the moon. We gasped. Exactly, said Halsey. The ill-fated Ballon expedition thought they had found it on the moon some years ago. A new type of ore, as rich in radium as our gold-bearing sands are rich in gold. 
Ballon's first samples gave uranium atoms with a fair representation of ionium and thorium, a richly radioactive ore. A lore of the pure radium is there somewhere, without doubt. He added vehemently, Do you understand now why we should be suspicious of this George Prince? He has a criminal record. He has a thorough technical knowledge of radium ores. He associates with Martians of bad reputation. A large Martian company has recently developed a radium engine to compete with our Earth motor. You know that? You know that there is very little radium available on Mars, and our government will not allow our own radium supply to be exported. That Martian company needs radium. It will do anything to get radium. What do you suppose it would pay for a few tons of really rich radioactive ore such as Grantline may have found on the moon? But, I objected, that is a reputable Martian company. It's backed by the government of the Martian Union. The government of Mars would not dare. Of course not, Captain Carter exclaimed sardonically. Not openly. But if Martian brigands had a supply of radium, I don't imagine where it came from would make much difference. That Martian company would buy it. Halsey added, And George Prince, my agents informed me, seems to know that Grantline is on the moon. Put it all together, lads. Little sparks show the hidden current. More than that, George Prince knows that we have arranged to have the planetaris stop at the moon and bring back Grantline's radium ore. This is your last voyage this year. You'll hear from Grantline this time, we're convinced. He'll probably give you the signal as you pass the moon on your way out. Coming back, you'll stop at the moon and transport whatever radium ore Grantline has ready. The Grantline flyer is too small for ore transportation. Halsey's voice turned grimly sarcastic. Doesn't it seem queer that George Prince and a few of his Martian friends happen to be listed as passengers for this voyage? In the silence that followed, Snap and I regarded each other. Halsey added abruptly, We had George Prince typed that time we arrested him four years ago. I'll show him to you. He snapped open an alcove and said to his waiting attendant, Get me the type of George Prince. The disc in a moment came through the pneumatic. Halsey, smiling wryly, adjusted it. A nice-looking fellow, nicely spoken, though at the time we made this he was somewhat annoyed, naturally. He is older now, twenty-nine to be exact. Here it is. The image glowed on the grids before us. His name, George Prince, in letters illumined upon his forehead, showed for a moment and then faded. He stood smiling sourly before us as he repeated the official formula. My name is George Prince. I was born in Great New York City 25 years ago. I gazed at this life-size moving image of George Prince. He stood somber in the black detention uniform. A dark, almost a girlishly handsome fellow, well below medium height, the rod beside him showed 5 feet 4 inches. Slim and slight, long wavy black hair falling about his ears. A pale, clean-cut, really handsome face, almost beardless. I regarded it closely a face that would have been femininely beautiful without its masculine touch of heavy black brows and firmly set jaw. His voice as he spoke was low and soft, but at the end, with the concluding words, I am innocent. It flashed into strong masculinity. His eyes, shaded with long girlish black lashes, by chance met mine. I am innocent. His curving sensuous lips drew down into a grim sneer. The type faded at its end. Halsey replaced the disc in its box and waved the attendant away. Thank you. He turned back to Snap and me. Well, there he is. We have nothing tangible against him now, but I'll say this. He's a clever fellow, one to be afraid of. I would not blare it from the newscaster's microphone, but if he is hatching any plot, he has been too clever for my agents. We talked for another half hour and then Captain Carter dismissed us. We left Halsey's office with Carter's final words ringing in our ears, Whatever comes, lads, remember, I trust you. Snap and I decided to walk a portion of the way back to the ship. It was barely more than a mile through this subterranean corridor to where we could get the vertical lift directly to the landing stage. We started off on the lower level. Once outside the insulation of Halsey's office, we did not dare talk of this thing. Not only electrical ears, 
but every possible eavesdropping device might be upon us. The corridor was 200 feet or more below the ground level. At this hour of the night, this business section was comparatively deserted. The through tube sounded over our heads with the passing of its occasional trains. The ventilators buzzed and whirred. At the cross intersections, the traffic detectors dozed at their posts. It was hot and sticky down here, and gloomy with the daylight globes extinguished, and only the night lights to give a dim illumination. The stores and office arcades were all closed and deserted, only an occasional night light burning beyond their windows. Our footfalls echoed on the metal grids as we hurried along. Nice evening, said Snap awkwardly. Yes, I said, isn't it? I felt oppressed, as though prying eyes and ears were here. We walked for a time in silence, each of us busy with memory of what had transpired in Halsey's office. Suddenly Snap gripped me. What's that? Where, I whispered. We stopped at a corner. An entryway was here. Snap pulled me into it. I could feel him quivering with excitement. What is it? I demanded in a whisper. We're being followed. Did you hear anything? No. Yet I thought now I could hear something. Vague footfalls. A rustling. And a microscopic electrical whine as though some device were near us. Snap was fumbling in his pocket. Wait, I've got a pair of low-scale phones. He put the little grids against his ears. I could hear the sharp intake of his breath. Then he seized me, pulled me down to the metal floor of the entryway. Back, Greg, get back! I could barely hear his whisper. We crouched as far back into the doorway as we could get. I was armed. My official permit for the carrying of the pencil heat ray allowed me to have it always with me. I drew it now. But there was nothing to shoot at. I felt snap clamping the grids on my ears. And now I heard something an intensification of the vague footsteps I had thought I heard before. There was something following us, something out in the corridor there now. A street light was nearby. The corridor was dim but plainly visible, and to my sight it was empty, but there was something there, something invisible. I could hear it moving. Creeping toward us, I pulled the grids off my ears. Snap murmured, You've got a local phone. Yes, I'll get them to give us the street glare. I pressed the danger signal, giving our location to the nearest operator. In a second or two, we got the light. The street in all this neighborhood burst into brilliant actinic glare. The thing menacing us was revealed, a figure in a black cloak crouching thirty feet away across the corridor. Snap was on his feet. His voice rang shrilly, There it is! Give it a shot, Greg! Snap was unarmed, but he flung his hands out menacingly. The figure, which may perhaps not have been aware of our city safeguard, was taken wholly by surprise. A human figure, seven feet tall at the least, and therefore I judged, doubtless a Martian man. The black cloak covered his head. He took a step toward us, hesitated, and then turned in confusion. Snap's shrill voice was bringing help. The whine of a street guard's alarm whistle nearby sounded. The figure was making off. My pencil ray was in my hand, and I pressed its switch. A tiny heat ray stabbed through the glare, but I missed. The figure stumbled, but did not fall. I saw a bare gray arm come from the cloak, flung up to maintain its balance. Or perhaps my pencil ray of heat had seared the arm. The gray-skinned arm of a Martian. Snap was shouting, Give him another! But the figure passed beyond the actinic glare and vanished. We were detained in the turmoil of the corridor for ten minutes or more with official explanations. Then a message from Halsey released us. The Martian who had been following us in his invisible cloak was never caught. We escaped from the crowd at last and made our way back to the Planetara where the passengers were already assembling for the outward Martian voyage. Chapter 2 A Fleeting Glance I stood on the turret balcony of the Planetara with Captain Carter and Dr. Frank, the ship surgeon, watching the arriving passengers. It was close to the zero hour. The level of the stage was a turmoil of confusion. The escalators with the last of the freight aboard were folded back, but the stage was jammed with the incoming passenger baggage. The interplanetary customs and tax officials with their X-ray and Z-ray paraphernalia, and the passengers themselves lined up for the export inspection. At this height, 
the city lights lay spread in a glare of blue and yellow beneath us. The individual local planes came dropping like birds to our stage. Thirty-eight passengers for this flight to Mars, but that accursed desire of every friend and relative to speed the departing voyager brought a hundred or more extra people to crowd our girders and bring added difficulty to everybody. Carter was too absorbed in his duties to stay with us long. But here in the turret, Dr. Frank and I found ourselves at the moment with nothing much to do but watch. Think we'll get away on time, Greg? No, I said, and this of all voyages. I checked myself with a thumping heart. My thoughts were so full of what Halsey and Carter had told us that it was difficult to rein my tongue. Yet here in the turret, unguarded by insulation, I could say nothing. Nor would I have dared mention the Grantline Moon Expedition to Dr. Frank. I wondered what he knew of this affair. Perhaps as much as I, perhaps nothing. He was a thin, dark, rather smallish man of fifty, this ship's surgeon, trimmed in his blue and white uniform. I knew him well. We had made several flights together. An American, I fancy, of Jewish ancestry, a likable man and a skillful doctor and surgeon. He and I had always been good friends. Crowded, said he. Johnson said thirty-eight. I hope they're experienced travelers. This pressure sickness is a rotten nuisance. Keeps me dashing around all night assuring frightened women they're not going to die. Last voyage, coming out of the Venus atmosphere, he plunged into a lugubrious account of his troubles with space-sick voyagers. But I was in no mood to listen. My gaze was down on the spider incline, up which, over the bend of the ship's sleek, silvery body, the passengers and their friends were coming in little groups. The upper deck was already jammed with them. The Planetara, as flyers go, was not a large vessel. Cylindrical of body, 40 feet maximum beam, and 275 feet in overall length. The passenger superstructure, no more than 100 feet long, was set amidships. A narrow deck, metallic enclosed, and with large bullseye windows, encircled the superstructure. Some of the cabins opened directly onto the deck. Others had doors to the interior corridors. There were half a dozen small but luxurious public rooms. The rest of the vessel was given to freight storage and the mechanism and control compartments. Forward of the passenger structure, the deck level continued under the cylindrical dome roof to the bow. The forward watchtower observatory was here. Officer's cabins, Captain Carter's navigating rooms, and Dr. Frank's office. Similarly, under the stern dome was the stern watchtower and a series of power compartments. Above the superstructure, a confusion of spider bridges, ladders, and balconies were laced like a metal network. The turret in which Dr. Frank and I now stood was perched here. Fifty feet away, like a bird's nest, Snap's instrument room stood clinging to the metal bridge. The dome roof, with the glassite windows rolled back now, rose in a mound peak to cover this highest middle portion of the vessel. Below, in the main hull, blue-lit metal corridors ran the entire length of the ship. Freight storage compartments, gravity control rooms, the air renewal systems, heater and ventilators and pressure mechanisms all were located there. And the kitchens, stewards' compartments, and the living quarters of the crew. We carried a crew of 16 this voyage, exclusive of the navigating officers and the purser, Snap Dean and Dr. Frank. The passengers coming aboard seemed a fair representation of what we usually had for the outward voyage to Ferrok Shan. Most were earth people and returning Martians. Dr. Frank pointed one out, a huge Martian in a gray cloak, a seven-foot fellow. His name is Set Miko, Dr. Frank remarked. Ever heard of him? No, I said, should I? Well, the doctor suddenly checked himself, as though he were sorry he had spoken. I've never heard of him, I repeated slowly. An awkward silence fell suddenly between us. There were a few Venus passengers. I saw one of them presently coming up the incline and recognized her. A girl traveling alone. We had brought her from Grebmar, last voyage but one. I remembered her. An alluring sort of girl, as most of them are. Her name was Venza. She spoke English well a singer and dancer who had been imported to Great New York to fill some theatrical engagement. She'd made quite a hit on the Great White Way. She came up the incline with a carrier ahead of her. Gazing up, she saw Dr. Frank and me at the turret window 
and waved her white arm in greeting, and flashed us a smile. Dr. Frank laughed. By the gods of the airways, there's Alta Venza. You saw that look, Greg. That was for me, not you. Reasonable enough, I retorted, but I doubt it. The Venza was nothing if not impartial. I wondered what could be taking Venza now to Mars. I was glad to see her. She was diverting. Educated, well-traveled, spoke English with a colloquial, theatrical manner more characteristic of Great New York than of Venus. And for all her light banter, I would rather put my trust in her than any Venus girl I had ever met. The hum of the departing siren was sounding. Friends and relatives of the passengers were crowding the exit incline. The deck was clearing. I had not seen George Prince come aboard, and then I thought I saw him down on the landing stage, just arrived from a private tube car. A small, slight figure. The customs men were around him. I could only see his head and shoulders. Pale, girlishly handsome face, long black hair to the base of his neck. He was bareheaded, with the hood of his traveling cloak pushed back. I stared and I saw that Dr. Frank was also gazing down, but neither of us spoke. Then I said upon impulse, Suppose we go down to the deck, Doctor. He acquiesced. We descended to the lower room of the turret and clambered down the spider ladder to the upper deck level. The head of the arriving incline was near us. Preceded by two carriers who were littered with hand baggage, George Prince was coming up the incline. He was closer now, I recognized him from the type we had seen in Halsey's office. And then with a shock, I saw it was not so. This was a girl coming aboard. An arch light over the incline showed her clearly when she was halfway up. A girl with her hood pushed back, her face framed in thick black hair. I saw now it was not a man's cut of hair, but long braids coiled up under the dangling hood. Dr. Frank must have remarked my amazed expression. Little beauty, isn't she? Who is she? We were standing back against the wall of the superstructure. A passenger was near us, the Martian whom Dr. Frank had called Miko. He was loitering here, quite evidently watching this girl come aboard. But as I glanced at him, he looked away and casually sauntered off. The girl came up and reached the deck. I am in A-22, she told the carrier. My brother came aboard two hours ago. Dr. Frank answered my whisper. That's Anita Prince. She was passing quite close to us on the deck, following the carrier, when she stumbled and very nearly fell. I was nearest to her. I leaped forward and caught her as she went down. Oh, she cried. With my arm about her, I raised her up and set her upon her feet again. She had twisted her ankle. She balanced herself upon it. The pain of it eased up in a moment. I'm all right, thank you. In the dimness of the blue-lit deck, I met her eyes. I was holding her with my encircling arm. She was small and soft against me. Her face, framed in the thick black hair, smiled up at me. Small oval face, beautiful, yet firm of chin, and stamped with the mark of its own individuality. No empty-headed beauty, this. I am all right. Thank you very much. I became conscious that I had not released her. I felt her hands pushing at me, and then it seemed that for an instant she yielded and was clinging, and I met her startled, upflung gaze, eyes like a purple night with a sheen of misty starlight in them. I heard myself murmuring, I beg your pardon, yes, of course. I released her. She thanked me again and followed the carrier along the deck. She was limping slightly from the twisted ankle. An instant while she had clung to me, and I had held her, a brief flash of something from her eyes to mine, from mine back to hers. The poets write that love can be born of such a glance. The first meeting across all the barriers of which love springs unsought, unbidden, defiant sometimes. And the troubadours of old would sing a fleeting glance, a touch, two wildly beating hearts, and love was born. I think with Anita and me it must have been like that. I stood gazing after her, unconscious of Dr. Frank, who was watching me with his humorous smile. And presently, no more than a quarter beyond the zero hour, the planetara got away. With the dome windows battened tightly, we lifted from the landing stage and soared over the glowing city. The phosphorescence of the electronic tubes was like a comet's tail behind us as we slid upward. At the trinite hour, 
The heat of our atmospheric passage was over. The passengers had all retired. The ship was quiet with empty decks and dim, silent corridors. Vibrationless, with the electronic engines cut off and only the hum of the Martell magnetizers to break the unnatural stillness. We were well beyond the Earth's atmosphere, heading out in the cone path of the Earth's shadow in the direction of the moon. Chapter 3 in the Helio Room At 6 a.m. Earth Eastern Time, which we were still carrying, Snap Dean and I were alone in his instrument room, perched in the network over the planetara's deck. The bulge of the dome enclosed us. It rounded like a great observatory window some twenty feet above the ceiling of this little metal cubbyhole. The planetara was still in the Earth's shadow. The firmament, black interstellar space with its blazing white, red, and yellow stars, lay spread around us. The moon, with nearly all its disk illumined, hung a great silver ball over our bow quarter. Behind it to one side, Mars floated like the red tip of a smoldering cigarillo in the blackness. The Earth, behind our stern, was dimly redly visible, a giant sphere etched with a configuration of its oceans and continents. Upon one limb, a touch of the sunlight hung on the mountain tops with a crescent red-yellow sheen. Then we plunged from the cone shadow. The sun, with a leaping corona, burst through the blackness behind us. The Earth lighted into a huge, thin crescent with hooked cusps. To Snap and me, the glories of the heavens were too familiar to be remarked, and upon this voyage particularly, we were in no mood to consider them. I had been in the helio room several hours. When the planetara started, and my few routine duties were over, I could think of nothing save Halsey and Carter's admonition, be on your guard, and particularly, watch George Prince. I had not seen George Prince, but I had seen his sister, whom Carter and Halsey had not bothered to mention. My heart was still pounding with the memory. When the passengers had retired and the ship quieted, I prowled through the passenger quarters. This was about the trinite hour. Hot as the quarters of hell, with our hull and the glassite dome seething with the friction of our atmospheric flight. But the refrigerators mitigated that. The ventilators blasted cold air from the renewers into every corner of the vessel. Within an hour or two, with the cold of space striking us, it was hot air that was needed. Dr. Frank evidently was having little trouble with pressure-sick passengers. The planetara's equalizers were fairly efficient. I did not encounter Dr. Frank. I prowled through the silent metal lounges and passages. I went to the door of A-22. It was on the deck level in a tiny transverse passage just off the main lounging room. Its name grid glowed with the letters Anita Prince. I stood in my short white trousers and white silk shirt, like a cabin steward gawping. Anita Prince. I had never heard the name until this night, but there was magic music in it now as I murmured it to myself. Anita Prince. She was here, doubtless asleep, behind this small metal door. It seemed as though that little oval grid were the gateway to a fairyland of my dreams. I turned away, and thought of the Grantline Moon Expedition stabbed at me. George Prince, Anita's brother, he whom I had been told to watch, this renegade, associate of dubious Martians plotting God knows what. I saw upon the adjoining door, A-20, George Prince. I listened. In the humming stillness of the ship's interior, there was no sound from these cabins. A-20 was without windows, I knew, but Anita's room had a window and a door which gave upon the deck. I went through the lounge, out its arch, and walked the deck length. The deck door and windows of A-22 were closed and dark. The ten-foot-wide deck was dim with white starlight from the side ports. Chairs were here, but they were all empty. From the bow windows of the arching dome, a flood of moonlight threw long, slanting shadows down the deck. At the corner where the superstructure ended, I thought I saw a figure lurking as though watching me. I went that way, but it vanished. I turned the corner, went the width of the ship to the other side. There was no one in sight, save the observer on his spider bridge, high in the bow network, and the second officer, on duty on the turret balcony almost directly over me. As I stood and listened, I suddenly heard footsteps. From the direction of the bow, a figure came, Purser Johnson. He greeted me. Cooling off, Greg? Yes, I said. He went past me and turned into the smoking room door nearby. 
I stood a moment at one of the deck windows, gazing at the stars. And for no reason at all, I realized I was tense. Johnson was a great one for his regular sleep. It was wholly unlike him to be roaming about the ship at such an hour. Had he been watching me? I told myself it was nonsense. I was suspicious of everyone, everything, this voyage. I heard another step. Captain Carter appeared from his chart room, which stood in the center of the narrowing open deck space near the bow. I joined him at once. Who is that? He half whispered. Johnson. Oh, yes. He fumbled in his uniform. His gaze swept the moonlit deck. Greg, take this. He handed me a small metal box. I stuffed it at once into my shirt. An insulator, he added swiftly. Snap is in his office. Take it to him, Greg. Stay with him. You'll have a measure of security, and you can help him to make the photographs. He was barely whispering. I won't be with you. No use making it look as though we were doing anything unusual. If your graphs show anything, or if Snap picks up any message, bring it to me. He added aloud. Well, it will be cool enough presently, Greg. He sauntered away toward his chart room. By heavens, what a relief, Snap murmured as the current went on. We had wired his cubby with the insulator. Within its barrage, we could at last talk with a degree of freedom. You seen George Prince, Greg? No, he's assigned A-20, but I saw his sister. Snap, no one ever mentioned. Snap had heard of her, but he hadn't known that she was listed for this voyage. A real beauty, so I've heard. A cursed shame for a decent girl to have a brother like that. I could agree with him there, but I made no comment. It was now 6 a.m. Snap had been busy all night with routine Cosmo radios from the Earth following our departure. He had a pile of them beside him. Many were for the passengers, but anything that savored of a code was barred. Nothing queer looking, I suggested? No, not a thing. We were at this time no more than some 65,000 miles from the moon's surface. The planetara presently would swing upon her direct course for Mars. There was nothing which could cause passenger comment in this close passing of the moon. Normally we used the satellite's attraction to give us additional starting speed. It was now or never that a message would come from Grantline. He was supposed to be upon this earthward side of the moon. While Snap had rushed through with his routine, I had searched the moon's surface with our glass, as I knew Carter was searching it, and also the observer in his tower, very possibly. But there was nothing. Copernicus and Kepler lay in full sunlight. The heights of the lunar mountains, the depths of the barren empty seas, were etched black and white, clear and clean. Grim, forbidding desolation, this unchanging moon. In romance, moonlight may shimmer and sparkle to light a lover's smile, but the reality of the moon is cold and bleak. There was nothing to show my prying eyes where the intrepid Grantline might be. Nothing at all, Snap. And Snap's helio mirrors, attuned for an hour now to pick up the faintest signal, were motionless. If he has concentrated any appreciable amount of radioactive ore, said Snap, we should get an impulse from its gamma rays. But our receiving shield was dark, untouched. We tried taking hydrogen photographic impressions of the visible moon surface. A sequence of them with stereoscopic lenses, 48 to the second, our mirror grid gave the magnified images. The spectral heliograph, with its wavelength selection, pictured the mountain levels and slowly descended into the deepest seas. There was nothing. Yet in those moon caverns, a million million recesses amid the crags of that tumbled barren surface, the pinpoint of movement which might have been Grantline's expedition could so easily be hiding. Could he have the ore insulated, fearing its gamma rays would betray its presence to hostile watchers? Or might disaster have come to him? Or he might not be on this hemisphere of the moon at all? My imagination, sharpened by fancy of a lurking menace which seemed everywhere about the planetara this voyage, ran rife with fears for Johnny Grantline. He had promised to communicate this voyage. It was now, or perhaps never. 6.30 came and passed. We were well beyond the Earth's shadow now. The firmament blazed with its vivid glories. The sun behind us was a ball of yellow-red leaping flames. The earth hung, open to a huge dull-red half-sphere. We were within some 40,000 miles of the moon. Great white ball, all of its disk visible to the naked eye. It poised over the bow, and presently, 
As the planetara swung upon her course for Mars, it shifted sidewise. The light of it glared white and dazzling in our tiny side windows. Snap, with his habitual red celluloid eye shade shoved high on his forehead, worked over our instruments. Greg! The receiving shield was glowing a trifle. Gamma rays were bombarding it. It glowed, gleamed phosphorescent, and the audible recorder began sounding its tiny, tinkling murmurs. Gamma rays! Snap sprang to the dials. The direction and strength were soon obvious. A richly radioactive ore body of considerable size was concentrated upon this hemisphere of the moon. It was unmistakable. He's got it, Greg. He's... The tiny helio mirrors began quivering. Snap exclaimed triumphantly, Here it comes! By God, the message at last! Bar off that light! I flung on the absorbers. The moonlight bathing the little room went into them, and darkness sprang around us. Snap fumbled at his instrument board. Actinic light showed dimly in the quivering thumbnail mirrors. Two of them. They hung poised on their cobweb wires, infinitely sensitive to the infrared light rays Grantline was sending from the moon. The mirrors in a moment began swinging. On the scale across the room, the actinic beams from them were magnified into sweeps of light. The message. Snap spelled it out, decoded it. Success. Stop for ore on your return voyage. We'll give you our location later. Success beyond our wildest hopes. The mirrors hung motionless. The shield where the gamma rays were bombarding went suddenly dark. Snap murmured, That's all. He's got the ore. Success beyond wildest hopes. That must mean an enormous quantity of it available. We were sitting in darkness, and abruptly I became aware that across our open window, where the insulation barrage was flung, the air was faintly hissing. An interference there. I saw a tiny swirl of purple sparks. Someone, some hostile ray from the deck beneath, or from the spider bridge that led to our little room, someone out there was trying to pry in. Snap impulsively reached for the absorbers to let in the outside light. It was all darkness to us outside, but I checked him. Wait! I cut off our barrage, opened our door, and stepped to the narrow metal bridge. Wait, Snap, you stay here. I added aloud. Well, Snap, I'm going to bed. Glad you've cleaned up that batch of work. I banged the door upon him. The lacework of metal bridges and ladders seemed empty. I gazed up to the dome and forward and aft. Twenty feet beneath me was the metal roof of the cabin superstructure. Below it, both sides of the deck showed. All patched with moonlight. No one visible down there. I descended a ladder. The deck was empty. But in the silence, something was moving. Footsteps moving away from me down the deck. I followed and suddenly I was running, chasing something I could hear but could not see. I turned into the smoking room. I burst in, and a real sound smothered the phantom. Johnson the purser was sitting here alone in the dimness. He was smoking. I noticed that his cigar held a long, frail ash. It could not have been him I was chasing. He was sitting there quite calmly, a thick-necked, heavy fellow, easily out of breath. But he was breathing calmly now. He sat up with amazement at my wild-eyed appearance, and the ash jarred from his cigar. Greg, what in the devil? I tried to grin. I'm on my way to bed. Worked all night helping Snap with those damn earth messages. I went past him, out the door, into the main interior corridor. It was the only way the invisible prowler could have gone. But I was too late now. I could hear nothing. I dashed forward into the main lounge. It was empty, dim, and silent. A silence broken presently by a faint click, a stateroom door hastily closing. I swung and found myself at a tiny transverse passage. The twin doors of A-22 and A-20 were before me. The invisible eavesdropper had gone into one of these rooms. I listened at each of the panels, but there was only silence within. The interior of the ship was suddenly singing with the steward siren, the call to awaken the passengers. It startled me. I moved swiftly away, but as the siren shut off, in the silence I heard a soft musical voice, Wake up, Anita. I think that's the breakfast call. And her answer. All right, George. I hear it. End of Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings. Chapters 1 through 3.